Have you ever heard of someone being afraid of Christmas? This is brand new to me. I've never heard anyone being afraid of Christmas before, but maybe you have. I've heard of people who have like kind of negative emotions and things come up during the holidays because of maybe some bad memories or maybe just not great feelings about the holidays, but I have never once heard of someone being afraid of Christmas. Well, recently I heard about this kind of wacky Christmas tradition and something I had never heard of, but this cousin would call his kid cousin a bunch during the holidays, uh, pretending to be Santa. And in this particular year, this guy who really enjoyed this tradition, he was 15 years old and his little cousin, his kid cousin, Grace Ann was only about six. And Grace Ann was absolutely obsessed with Santa. And so when she started getting calls from Santa every week, she was just pumped up. Now, one Sunday afternoon, things changed a little bit and, and not for the better because the older cousin was telling a few of the other family members about this tradition that he had with Grace Ann where he'd call to be Santa and the other cousin, another cousin named Brian, said that he wanted to give it a shot and call up Grace Ann right then and there. So Brian gets on the phone and he's got the phone on speakerphone so that everyone, all these other family members around can hear the conversation that he's having with Grace Ann. And he starts out just kind of doing the normal Santa thing, right? Ho, 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 Merry Christmas, all that kind of stuff. And it was going great until he decided to take things a little bit too far. He started to use this like really creepy voice to remind Grace Ann that he, Santa, knew where, the, where she was sleeping and knew when she was awake. He told her that he had been watching her and in all the family, right? They're hearing this phone call and they're just cracking up, dying laughing because it is so funny to them what Brian is saying to this, his little cousin, Grace Ann. But then Brian crossed a line. He told Grace Ann that she was on the naughty list. Now, Brian did remind Grace Ann that as Santa, he had the power to allow her to get some presents, but she had to turn things around. Well, again, everyone's dying laughing. They're loving this kind of thing that Brian's doing. But then about 20 minutes later, after Brian had hung up with Grace Ann, Grace Ann's mom walks through the door. She lived just down the street and she was coming over and she was fuming mad. And all she could say was that Grace Ann was terrified. Grace Ann had closed all the blinds and she had turned off all the lights and she was hiding under her bed because she was afraid that Santa could see her and was watching her and was coming to find her. All she could think of was that Christmas was too scary and now she didn't want any of it. And so finally Brian says, you know what, I'm going to go over, I'm going to talk to Grace Ann and say, say, I'm not the real Santa. You don't need to worry about it. It was just me. It was all in fun. But the truth is Grace Ann was still afraid of Santa after that and still afraid of Christmas. The family had to keep reminding Grace Ann, do not be afraid. Don't worry. Christmas is not something you need to be afraid of. You do not need to worry. Again, the fear of Christmas. This is brand new to me. This is the first story I had ever heard about someone being afraid of Christmas. So last week we started this new teaching series called New Seasons Greetings, where we're kind of taking a look at the Christmas story in some different ways than we're used to. And when we think about this idea of fear around Christmas time, again, it's not something we normally connect with. I've gotten so many Christmas cards and I've seen so many things and so many passages about scripture, but you never connect Christmas with this idea of do not be afraid. That's maybe something we would associate more with Halloween, right? The fear of Halloween, not so much something that we would associate with the Christmas season. There are all sorts of emotions that we do experience during the Christmas season, right? Joy and wonder, and maybe, maybe even a little bit of anxiety, right? Thinking about the busyness of the season, maybe thinking about some of these more negative emotions that we experience, but we don't typically, again, associate fear with Christmas. But here's the thing, if we are honest with ourselves and we're thinking about the idea of Christmas and we're thinking about all the money that we have to spend on our friends and family and we're thinking about all the social stuff that comes up at Christmas, all these different things that happen, maybe deep down we are afraid of the Christmas season. And the neat thing as we make this connection is that the Christmas story, when we read it in scripture, starts out with this phrase, do not be afraid. And tonight as we talk about fear and Christmas, this kind of strange relationship, we're going to look at the Christmas story and we're going to examine four different people that we hear from and how each of their stories start in scripture. The first person we're going to look at tonight is this guy named Zechariah. And we're going to start by reading his story in the book of Luke. 
Right in Luke chapter 1, we see Zechariah's story starting at verse 5, going to verse 13. And I'm reading from the NIV tonight. It says this, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time of the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. So get this, Zechariah was a priest, and he spent time with God all day, but still he was afraid. He was a loyal husband to a godly wife, but still he was afraid. He was in the middle of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be a priest, and he was even chosen out of, you know, out of thousands of priests to burn incense in the temple. This might have been one of the most meaningful things he ever did in his entire career, and yet he was still afraid. Here's the thing, maybe this is something that you resonate with. Zechariah was afraid that God wasn't listening to his prayers. He was afraid that this great desire that he and his wife Elizabeth had to have kids wasn't being heard. And he was afraid that God had forgotten about him. But then again, in verse chapter 19, like we just read, Gabriel shows up and says to him, do not be afraid. The thing that Zechariah was so afraid that would never happen was about to happen. He was going to be the dad of this really special guy named John, and he would later be known as John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was going to go on and be kind of the person who led into Jesus' career, who came just before Jesus to prepare the way we read about in Scripture. Zechariah was afraid that God wouldn't answer his prayers, but instead God answers his prayers in the most meaningful way. And all of a sudden he was preparing this way for Jesus through Zechariah's lineage. Part of understanding the Christmas story as we're learning through Zechariah is that even though sometimes it feels like God isn't answering our prayers or doing the things in the way that we thought he would, he may be laying the groundwork for something incredible. And this is something we've been talking a lot about over this fall. The next place in scripture that we see this idea of do not be afraid is maybe one you're a little bit more familiar with. A little bit later on in Luke chapter 1, we read about Mary's story and when Gabriel comes to tell her that she's going to be carrying the Savior of the world. Let's read about what happens again in Luke chapter 1, but starting at verse 26. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, this... The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now here's the thing. Zechariah, he had this fear that was kind of unwarranted, maybe not unwarranted, but unexpected. But Mary's fear is fully warranted and fully expected. Something we don't often talk about with the story of Mary was that she was probably only about 14, between 14 and 17 years old. At this point, she had her whole life planned out. She was engaged to this guy named Joseph. She knew that she was going to get married and it was going to be great. But then she knew when she found this out that her fiance was not going to be happy. And on top of that, Joseph, as her betrothed, which is just like a fancy way of saying engaged in Israel, had this legal right that he could have her executed because she was pregnant with someone else's kid. She didn't just fear for her future marriage, she feared for her life. And even if she wasn't put to death and she did marry Joseph, what would the people around her think? She had a well-earned reputation and the people around her may turn on her. And so in a matter of seconds, when she's visited by Gabriel, she recognizes that everything was going to change. Understandably, she has some questions. And in Luke chapter 1 at verse 34, she says, How will this be since I am a virgin? 
But ultimately, the neat thing about this story is that even though it was scary, Mary still chose God's plan. Even though it could cost her absolutely everything, she knew what it meant to be following God's plan and following the thing that God had for her, like we talked in our last series about God's will. Just listen to the way that Mary responds to Gabriel in verse 38. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then Gabriel leaves her. Part of Christmas is realizing that we don't need to be afraid to follow God's plan for our lives. When we trust God with the course and the path for our lives, we don't need to be afraid. So Mary was one person, but there was a second person involved, right? Joseph. As far as we know, Joseph was a really good guy, but still when, she, when he hears the news about Mary being pregnant, I'm sure that his life just felt like it was being shattered. He had worked his entire life to make sure that he could support a family, to get married and have a kid, but now he was probably realizing in the moment that he may have to start this completely over. Now again, from the story, we know that he had the option to have her maybe publicly humiliated or again executed, but instead he chose the route of saying he was gonna deal with it privately and not involve anyone else. He had this plan just to kind of go on separately in his ways, right? Let Mary have her baby and he would do his own thing. But then we know that he was visited, visited by an angel as well. We read in the book of Matthew at chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his, pe his people from their sins. So again, we're reading about our third different do not be afraid, and Joseph's was very different than what we're seeing from Zechariah or Mary. And here's the difference. Zechariah and Mary were hearing this do not be afraid about kind of easing into what they were doing, into having a level of comfort. But Joseph's was a command. God was basically saying to Joseph, I know you don't understand what's happening and I know it's scary, but just obey me. And look at what Joseph did in verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Can you imagine how this conversation would have gone? He couldn't just call her or text her. He had to get up and walk across town and go to Mary's house so that he could have a conversation with her. Mary wouldn't have known if Joseph was showing up to have her killed or publicly scorned or what he was doing in general being there. But then he said to her, I'm going to marry you. It doesn't matter. I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'm still going to marry you. Again, part of the Christmas story is knowing that we can obey God even when it doesn't make much sense to us and even when it seems counterintuitive. If there's something that you feel like God is commanding you to do, then do it. And the last group of people who had this do not be afraid kind of moment are a group of people that outside of kind of the Christmas story don't get talked about very much. In their society, the shepherds, who we're going to talk about in just a moment, were really like the lowest rung on the ladder. They were at the very bottom of their class system. So we know that when we read the Christmas story that Caesar Augustus had called for a census and everyone was going back to their hometowns to make sure that they got counted. So everyone's traveling and everyone's doing their things to get back to their kind of place of origin. But we see that the shepherds just kind of hang out and they stay in their fields and they do their thing. They were kind of like this afterthought, right? Everyone who was important enough went back to be counted in the census, but you know, the shepherds, they can kind of just do their thing. They're fine on their own. Honestly, they didn't seem to matter much to the Roman government or to the Jewish officials, but they mattered so much to God. We read their story in Luke chapter two, and it says this, and there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the God shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Again, we see the angel say the exact same thing they've said to Zechariah, to Mary, and to Joseph. Do not be afraid. These guys might have been overlooked and misunderstood by everybody else except God knew how important they were. The last part of the Christmas story that we can see and kind of take from these do not be afraid moments is that we don't need to be afraid as to whether or not God loves us and appreciates each one of us. The shepherds mattered to God and you matter to God. You know, our typical like seasons greetings when we talk to people, it's either Merry Christmas or Happy Christmas, I guess, if you're British. 
but the original season's greetings was do not be afraid. As we see, these four things show us that so much of the Christmas story revolves around this idea of God reminding his people that they don't need to be afraid no matter what. We don't need to be afraid of whether or not God is going to answer our prayers because he might just have something bigger on the horizon for you. We don't need to be afraid because if God has your plan under control, as long as we're listening to what God is telling us, we don't need to be afraid of what the outcome is going to be. We don't need to be afraid of being obedient to God because when we're obedient, God will do great things through us. And we really don't need to be afraid of whether or not we matter to God because God has created us all equally and all so, so important to him. Fear cannot be an excuse for us this Christmas because four times through the story, we see this commandment, do not be afraid. So what does it look like for you to have a Christmas this year without fear? What does that mean for the way that you spend your money and your time and your attention? What would happen if you rested in the confidence that God has a plan and that he answers our prayers and that he wants us to obey and that we all matter so much to him? When you take fear out of the equation, you are free to experience Christmas the way it should be. This understanding that you matter to God and that God has a plan and that God loves you. You're going to unpack this a little bit more in your small groups tonight. And so we're going to end here. You're going to pray together in your small groups once you get there. And then we're going to continue on this series and actually finish it off next week as we talk about New Seasons Greetings uh, Week 3. So I hope you have a great rest of your night, a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you again soon.